it's really nice to be here today. Uh, it's kind of actually emotional to be here because we've been working on this uh, encounter for uh, the last two years, more or less. So it's really, really nice. Uh, and this encounter has been organized by Latin Elephant and Working Disobedience Platform um, with support from Tate and in this session with, in partnership with Glassworks. This encounter is part of Latin Elephant's public program 2021-2022 called Inhabiting Spaces, which is founded, fun, uh, funded by the Arts Council England and aims to promote access and increase participation in the arts by the Latin American communities in the UK. To give you a little bit of context, Latin Elephant is a charity that promotes alternative and innovative ways, uh, ways of engaging with migrants and ethnic, ethnic minorities in the UK, uh, groups, particularly the Latin American community, uh, facing processes of urban change in London. And Working Disobedience Platform is uh, integrated by Maria Rosario Montero from Chile, Juan Fabri from Bolivia, and me. Uh, I'm from Chile, but I'm living here in, in, in London now. Uh, and we work with an interest in contaminating and moving through diverse fields of uh, knowledges and practices. Um, with the aim of disobeying and blurring the limits between them. In terms of this encounter, which is the, um, uh, the name of the encounter is Working Disobedience from Latin America. Its aim is to address contemporary art practices and colonialism, anti-colonialism and decolonialism in Latin America and from Latin America, focusing on the different forms that power takes in the region and how it's performed. During the sessions, we have been thinking and discussing collectively how to activate a de-anti-colonial practice um, in Latin America, from Latin America, and how to dislocate power relations within the art system, and how to propose new power dynamics for an extended art field. In today's conversation, which is uh, called Decolonial Perspectives on Exhibition Making, Heritage, and Material Cultures, we will discuss with our uh, brilliant speakers Victoria Vargas, Pamela Gomez, and Diego Chocano, the politics of this play, heritage and material cultures, in order to interrogate the future, uh, the future role and place for art within institutions. And before presenting our first speaker, I would like to thank Laura, Sabel, Sheena, and Joel from Gasworks, who have made this event happen today, and to Catalina, who has been assisting us to put this encounter in motion. Moving to the colonial perspectives, uh, our panel discussion today, moving to the colonial perspective on exhibition making, heritage and material cultures, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Victoria Vargas, uh, who is a Chilean art historian and heritage researcher based in Leeds. She is currently in the final year of her PhD at the School of Fine Art, History of Art and Cultural Studies at the University of Leeds. And her research addresses the relationship between contemporary art and heritage from a decolonial perspectives. She has participated in art projects in Chile, Sao Paulo, Los Angeles, Vienna, the UK and Belgrade. She has worked as teacher and research assistant in different art organizations in Chile including museums, galleries, and non-profit institutions. She is part of the coordinating team of the ECR network of the Association of Critical Heritage Studies and Ventana Conference on Latin America. Okay, I want to thank uh, the team of Working Disobedience and Latin Elephant for the invitation, and also Gaswar for hosting us tonight. Um, before starting, uh, I need to acknowledge some basics. Some of them will make you feel uncomfortable. Uh, these are such as our privilege, skins, color, nationality, race, resources, languages, education, knowledge. Me sitting, me sitting here and you there. I need to acknowledge silence and absence, indigenous and ancestral voices erased from history. 
before untangling colonial structures and privilege, uh, we need to start to by acknowledge people's forced displacement of ancestral, ancestral lands, uh, voices and names. For this presentation, I want to reflect on the fabric composed by contemporary art and heritage from a decolonial point of view. I will explore how contemporary art challenges core issues in Western ontology and open the reflection about decolonizing heritage as a complex nexus of interaction and mutual constitutionality. The intervention I'm going to perform here crosses different levels and requires the audience willingness to let go some assumptions that we make and structures that we hold. In other words, uh, to be open to being vulnerable, vulnerable and precarious. What I propose here is an ontological disobedience, the type of disobedience that cracks and opens the ground like seeds, semillas de coloniales, the colonization itself comes with a notion that challenges and contests Western ontology, such as separation, universality, and linear temporalities. To inactively decolonize, I need uh, to consciously disobey. Firstly, instead of separating and constraining concepts, I suggest open them and expand them, letting them interact uh, in multiple productive ways. Secondly, the universal monolingual feature that punishes us when we don't speak or master a foreign language. Permitamos múltiples voces hablar and acknowledge mis uh, mistakes as part of those colonial differences that are still present. And finally, uh, linear and progressive narrative. Instead, I suggest waving an argument as a braid where multiple narratives and ideas can entangle. Empecemos. Um, heritage has been traditionally conceived as, a pro as an object, places of the past, that we need to save war for the future. The origin of the concept is paired with the development of dev devices such as the universities, museums, and national states. Uh, this image is from Google. And when you uh, type heritage, this is probably what is going to appear in the first images. And as you can see, it's mainly European heritage sites. Uh, nothing else to say about that. Um, as colonial invention, heritage is one of the concepts that better summarize the modern thought that made it emerge. Objects, places, and practice are normally declared heritage because they condense ideas of progress, development, prosperity, and values to be preserved for the future. Western epistemology, with the focus on materiality, the object, practice, or the space, encapsulate heritage into categories such as natural, cultural, tangible, or intangible. The only thing in common to be heritage is that it needs to be something from the past, in the present, and for the future. During the last decade, a critical heritage studies have challenged the traditional heritage conception, integrating different reflections that rethink the field uh, within their material, political, and ecological implications. While the ontological turn has been key in questioning the Cartesian division and integrating non-Western uh, appreciations, there are some features that haven't been better explored and they are in the current heritage conception. And this is the linearity and the material agency. While Hegelian schema presents history a progress as a progression and its narrative as an objective successive accounts of the past, the notion of time is introduced in, as a line where the past is behind and the future vision. In the same way that the Cartesian gates separate human and culture, objects, subjects, linearity creates the illusion of distance between the present, past, and future. When we locate ourselves within Western temporal temporality, like an arrow, we turn our backs 
to the past while we are pushed to face a blurry uh, future, hoping to accomplish the promises of development and prosperity. This means that in terms of heritage, we see objects of size firstly from a distant past and secondly as something fragile and threatened by the of the future. In this constant danger and threat, we need to move forward pretending that the objects or places have not changed. We are taught to preserve since the discovery as frozen in time and we condemn the objects to remain the same for the future. We have the obligation of taking care of the past while we face the impossibility of going back. Somehow it's our responsibility. And we take for granted that what we are going to, what we have to preserve will be important for future gen generations. Then we pass it on as heritage, asking them doing the same. Then the past is something back there, very distant, uh, with no continuity with the present and its transference is closer to an imposed value than a current significance. The remains of the past are analyzed, studied, preserved, but never touched. In this modern view, heritage is meant to be state ideally for the eternity in the distant past for the future. This modern notion of heritage suggests a, a, a future orientation which denies the possibility of heritage creation, appropriation, and engagement for the present. It denies the possibility of change for the present and reproduce an hegemonic model. So how to rethink heritage beyond this future orientation we preserve for the future? Uh, how to disobey this modern command of heritage and how we can challenge uh, the devices created to maintain this hegemonic order? Basically, how we decolonize heritage when fanons remember us that the master tool will never dismantle the master house. For this task, uh, I argue that alternative ontologies in contemporary artworks propose notions of time, sense and material agency that challenge the hegemonic heritage field. And they propose, propose new ways of reengaging and updating heritage within contemporary political concerns at the same time that create the possibility of conceiving heritage beyond the Western linearity, including sensing, thinking, thinking, acting, senti pensare. Oops, sorry. So here is when I come to the analysis. Uh, this is a poem of the Chilean artist and poet Cecilia Vicuña. Her work can be described as a complex net of mediums, uh, meanings, metaphor, basis of ancient traditions, precarious subjects, and forgotten words. Through different language, she weighs visual and our resources, creating sensory metaphors, making her world resonate as a wave of energy, and transforming it into new meanings and thoughts. In this poem, uh, we can see how this key poem illustrates an alternative way of approaching the idea of time. Time comes from to renew the past, the future is behind, it has not arrived yet, they say in the Andes, while also encompassing the ancestral indigenous wisdom from the Andes and Koji people. The poem explains how in the Andes the order is inverted, it's not a static or just chronological. The linear time changes to a rapid shape where the past is continually renewed and not, while the future is behind. Um, then what is implied by a future that is behind when the hegemonic heritage appreciation has been always looking forward, we preserve for the future? And how can we challenge the ideas of heritage through these works? And how they present a new ontology or, or a different ontology to appreciate heritage in new different ways. So to think Heritage to the world of Cecilia Vicuña is to think in multi-directional, multi-temporal, and multi-sensory ways. Uh, it questions the key essence of Western uh, heritage field, uh, the material conditions, the practice, and how the experience and artistic practice is appropriated and resignified. Uh, what I'm showing here are precarious, 
the precarious are also called basuritas, literal rubbish. They are visual metaphors made in the space. The precarious are not made to last. They are made for the enjoyment of the present and come with idea. Uh, with a, they are, uh, sorry, <laughs> and the precarious are a very small sculptures or installation made of found objects. Good feather shells clothe the stone. Located in the landscape studio over the street, as a gift to the cosmos, they are made to vanish in the hands of nature, human, and more than human, the invisible agencies, recognizing the power and interaction. But how those fragile or these fragile objects challenge this heritage conception, you will say. Uh, they are works intended to disappear. They establish a relationship and equilibrium with the material and the present. They do not attempt to recall a glorious past, what they were. Uh, rather, they are presented as they are in the present, as fragile, ma uh, as fragile little fragments and pieces harmonically displayed, a small sculpture characterized by its fragility, an assemblage that creates visual poetry, recognizing vulnerability, but also acknowledging the inter interdependency between pieces. In Vicuña's work, the precarious have no concern with the future. They evolve within the present. Another example are the well-known kipus. A kipu is a three-dimension and tactile visual system for recording accounts uh, and, based, and narratives based on color cards from the Inca. Uh, in the Inca period, the kipu were a, a tactile device reading public performance. However, today the meaning of this device is lost, not because the kipu don't remember, but because we don't know how to read them. As a response to the colonial violence, Vicuña used the absence of many of the kipu, updating it uh, in a contemporary experience as a claim for environmental responsibility and political practice. She reappropriate and resignified. Vicuña's kipus performance, uh, the raw wool of the kipu is presented as a light blood, white, a white cloud, or melting snow, circulating and moving through people. The meaning is created by the act of touching, activating a reciprocal exchange and a tactile sense in between the interaction. Her artistic practice disrupt, disobey, and protest the gap between the past and the future. From here, while hegemonic logic frames the interaction with objects of knowledge uh, and the past as some do not touch the Amerindian and Vicuña system, expose a logic where only performing the act of touching uh, it's possible to activate the knowledge recorded in the courts. In this sense, the pieces rethink and reinterrogate the construction of cultural memory. Her work is not a recall for a nostalgic ideal past, but a reminder that what we see in the present is constantly renegotiated with oblivion. Some fragmentos que hacen sentido. Poetic actions to be resignified in the present. It explores the possibility of forgotten alternative times and social hierarchies, breaking with colonial logics that point to separation and Cartesian gaze. And, of course, the emphasis in the future. Um, in the case of Icuña, her work deals with symbols, rituals interwined with ideas of extraction, cultural appropriation, and the destruction of natural heritage. It reconnects with a Mary Indian tradition of reciprocity, interconnectedness, and coexistence. Somehow, this work creates an epistemology that is capable of being nurtured by the paradox of history instead of neglecting them. In doing so, they develop a relationship where art and heritage become mutually constituent. And here basically is how these different layers are together or facing each other in some way. Um, either visual or auditory stimuli, when contemporary art interacts with heritage, it pulls, it pulls and tensions the, the threat of the symbolic fabric, allowing to unwave the ontological assumptions present in Western heritage interpretation, creating new sources for rewaving and rethinking heritage and the relationship 
from a decolonial perspective as a way of doing. Uh, the artworks challenge the symbolic material feature of heritage and history at the same time that they're reactivating ancient knowledge and practice. They, they recognize the value of the past for the present, activating meanings, conflicts, and sorry, meaning conflicts. Uh, sorry, I got look. Okay, meaning conflicts and challenge of the present. Uh, this is what Rivera Gosikanki calls a uh, non-digested past. Uh, but this is not happening like as a term of solving, but a, a term of presenting alternatives to recognize them, sometimes digest them or even heal them in the present. Beyond the division of human and nature, the colonizing heritage through contemporary art opened the possibility of exploring alternatives way of time appreciation challenging heritage dynamics and conceptions. In here, Vicuña's work presents a new and alternative way for building connections with the past and the present. In this sense, it's integrating new voices and an agency, recognizing embodied practices, material agencies, and understanding the multiple levels and relationship between people more than human and other agencies. But it also gives some clues of how the past and the present are together how the interaction of heritage and contemporary art create each other, touch each other. Art words that modify heritage meaning by integrating new conceptualiza conceptualizations, forms of mutual creation. Allowing uh, to propose that heritage is such when it's used and activated when it's touched. It is open the possibility that recognizing the energy of the matter, we can see the past, face it and appropriate it in the present. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you for uh, having me and for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here and also be real life people. Um, yeah, it's a double experience. Uh, well, my, um, I am a Bolivian photographer, and as I am also self-identified as an <clears throat> as an indigenous woman, and for that reason, uh, race uh, representation and indigeneity for me is uh, very central to my artistic practice. Um, in this opportunity, I'm going to propose a visual essay. Uh, that addresses different elements that I think uh, still have a great impact in the narratives that are used to represent indigeneity. Uh, I started this work after um, uh, founding a picture of two adolescents from the Argentine and Chaco, taken in the 19th century. And I started tracing the history behind this, these pictures and at the same time, trying to understand uh, what are the, uh, the stereotypes and other elements that are attached to the image of indigeneity. Well, um, before I start, I will, I will say something about the history of the, uh, of the picture. The picture to your left uh, was, these three pictures uh, were taken by uh, German anthropologists in the 19th century. <coughs> uh, well, these pictures are uh, very raw. I think the first time I saw these photographs, uh, they produced me a very negative impact, and I kept them in my memory from a very long time because I think they encapsulate in a in a way various elements of uh, indigeneity that still today. Um, I find uh, distressing. In my own photographic practice, I, I, obs I have observed how, how photographs of indigenous people evoke an impression of poverty, dispossession, and backwardness. Uh, technically, this is even the case in my, in my personal experience when I show a photograph that depicts a wealthy family of indigenous people. It is as um, Indigenous clothing or ethnic features uh, seems to be enough to situate them in a place of marginality. Poverty in this sense, or at least a subordinated position, appears uh, to be constitu constitutive of indigeneity. 
In this sense, uh, this work for me was a way to understand what are the historical, social, and aesthetic forces that motivated uh, the creation of this kind of um, representation. <clears throat> um, the two pictures, the, the left from and the right, were taken at the same time in Argentina. Uh, uh, an entrepreneur, Jose Podesta, uh, traveled to the Argentinian Chaco in search for a sample of 24 people from the Tobatashic indigenous community. Um, his mission uh, had the purpose to exhibit this group of people as a part of the li life display of colonized people at the exposition of Universal uh, in the 1900s in Paris. Uh, however, this incident, incident triggered a big debate in the media press, and eventually Argentinian authorities decided that uh, his intentions were immoral in order to keep the indigenous people under civil guard. <clears throat> well, but, but the press and authorities uh, were not concerned about the, the, these 24 people particularly. Instead, they were worried that these people would be the only representation of, of Argentina as a civilized uh, in, in such important event. So they thought that, that this image could endanger uh, the image of Argentina as a civilized country to the eyes to the world. While these events were happening, um, a German anthropologist uh, took the pictures that are on the left. The, well, very briefly, the, the history behind this kind of picture, which is very well known from the colonized uh, type of uh, representation, especially from anthropological and ethnographic photography, it co came from the age of the Enlightenment, when um, development of modern physiognomy and the elaboration of theories of racial difference <clears throat> were created under the idea of the phenotypic variation of the body as a signifier of race. Uh, in this sense, social Darwinism um, was a bit abstract for the time, so it needed uh, something more concrete, and some more visual. Uh, for this purpose, colonized people were depicted as object of anthropological and ethnographic studies. Uh, of course, all of this was instrumental for imperialist expansion and it legitimized oppression. Uh, well, to understand the racialization of the indigenous body, I think it's necessary to review some ideas uh, around the con concept of the race. And for that purpose, I'm going to talk about three aspects. Uh, one would be the creation of the, uh, of the self-invention of the white body, the creation of the two visual tropes, the authentic and the naked body. the self-invention of the white. The racialization of the other uh, body came also with the invention of the Christian body as a white figure. Europeans uh, started to represent themselves uh, visually as pure, pure white during the late Middle Ages. Byzantine and early 12th century artists depicted faces and bodies with heavy layers of pigment that, that contrasted strongly with their garments. This tradition, uh, which lasted for several centuries, finally changed by the late 13th century. And we can see the shift uh, comparing these two images uh, that has a difference of a couple of centuries, uh, when we can see clearly that um, initially there was a lot of use of color uh, and pigment in contrast uh, with the second picture when the color is almost, uh, has almost gone. Um, also, uh, in this kind of imagery, tiny, tiny noses and mouths, pale brown hair, and a radical simplification of a racial expression were also introduced as a new representational code. Consequently, uh, the enemy, the other, was classified with the rest of the colors. In fact, um, color devils started to be used in order to categorize the bad, the ugly, the sinful. This anticipated the color designation that colonizers later imprinted to the rest of the world. And 
Of course, uh, indigenous people uh, still carry the burden of, su of such uh, racist chromophobia. And when the indigenous body is photographed, um, it's impregnated by all this colonial historical construction. Now, well, in this picture, we can see how uh, the Virgin Mary is uh, losing uh, her colors through the time. Mm. Other col uh, colonial trope that is still in use today is the authentic native. This visual trope, uh, this idea of authenticity, started in the 19th century. The colonial apparatus that promoted uh, what has been termed as ethnological shows uh, were spectacles were, um, were uh, that were created between two anxieties, the myth of the dying races and the obsession for authenticity. The dying races uh, myth pretended to be a scientific explanation for the massive decline of colonized population. It was it was also argued that colonized people were declining due to an, an alleged self-genocide. And all of these concepts are, are today still in use to represent or to talk about indigeneity or indigenous uh, art or indigenous thought. Uh, they said that these people preferred um, to disappear rather than abandon their heritage and traditional ways of living. Uh, to dramatize even more, the public was promised uh, a great display of authenticity. They would get to see uh, not just people from distant lands, um, uh, but the authentic, the native. Elaborated costumes complemented with exotic devices were used to accentuate racial and cultural difference. These elements were obviously shown as genuine, and it is clear by now that those performances were merely a fantasy. These actually offered mixed references from different cultures. Right. However, uh, those, uh, uh, those concepts are still in use today, and they are still used as a neocolonial narrative that presents idealized Im images that praise indigenous people's cultural distinctiveness and attach to them uh, certain essentialist attributes. For instance, uh, development and indigeneity are often represented in a binary discussion that traditional, modern, or uncivilized and civilized. Consequently, an indigenous person is expected to live in harmony with nature and even to represent an alternative to capitalist modernity. An essentialized uh, indigenous way of life is presented as compatible and harmonic with biodiversity preservation. In parallel, indigenous people are considered unfit to interact with markets and in need of protection against economic forces. These are elements, these elements are still in use today to represent uh, contemporary authenticity in indigeneity. Is a new fo form of colonialism is as much in as much as it relegates them to subordinate spaces, distant rural territories, and impoverished livelihoods. Furthermore, the use of landscapes also reinforce um, the colonial tropes of indigeneity. Landscapes can be central to the information of social and subjective identities. In photography, the landscape can have the power to set an atmosphere or reinforce social or political ideology. In this sense, the ethnological show carefully constructs its landscapes. Every sign of modernization is erased. These landscapes offer the impression of being authentically wild. Th this operation makes it uh, almost impossible for the public to avoid the bias. The narrative is rounded and offers no element from which the audience can make connections with their own life. Authenticity, in this, in this sense, objectifies the other. Other uh, visual tropes that is still in use is um, the naked Indian. The use of the naked body of racialized people has been always used as an opposite of the artistic nude in classical art. 
for the Christian tradition, uh, nakedness represents a canonical uh, narrative of uh, spiritual hazard. Nakedness is different from nudeness. In Western art history, nude figures are actually considered heroic. It's an art in itself. It is considered a creation that does not try to imitate the, imitate the a body but, uh, from nature, but to perfect it. Being naked, however, implies shame and embarrassment. As John Berger argues, that nude is a convention and a form of dress that covers the real one, the naked one. These uh, colonial uh, photographs uh, that started in the 1900s were thought uh, to be a very straightforward task for uh, the colonial administrators. However, we know that uh, this wasn't the case in colonial administrators of the time. Um, <coughs> Uh, they face, uh, uh, it was very difficult for them to take pictures of naked, uh, naked pictures of indigenous people. So they were forced to use people from, colon from colonies or, or, slave or slave owning states or places where people were almost completely uh, subjugated. However, uh, it seems that most representation of indigeneity, contemporary indigeneity is still following this path in classifying and showing a, a ethnological shows and, and talking about a certain distinctiveness attached to the indigenous thought on special uh, ways of living that can be an answer for the contemporary problems that we are facing. Uh, all of these elements uh, were uh, all of these elements were important at the time to construct this idea of nakedness for uh, Tashik and Norik. But these pictures uh, were taken at the same time by the media, where while they were they were discussing what to do with these people, and we can clearly see how these narratives uh, from. Uh, the 19th century uh, are still in use today, almost without, um, without, uh, uh, with very little difference. Um, in it, uh, today we can also uh, still see the pictures of the naked um, Tashik and Nordic uh, at the British uh, Library, and then they are displayed. Uh, under a very impersonal label, uh, which does not even mention their names. So uh, the uses of these images um, has a very big burden uh, over the indigenous experience today. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm going to be reading a, a paper that discusses uh, the, the importance of using intersectionality as a, a framework or, or a conceptual tool within exhibitions of, of Latin American art. Um, so I wrote this paper, I guess, yeah, before I start, I want to preface by saying I wrote this paper um, five years ago, uh, so quite a long time ago, when um, terms like intersectionality and, and decolonizing were, um, I mean, already at that time becoming uh, like these you already started hearing them all the time. They, they were becoming these buzz terms that um, were already sort of beginning to lose their meaning, I guess. And if you, I guess, like fast forward now to today, um, everyone is uh, decolonizing everything and everyone's feminism must be intersectional. Um, you, you hear these terms a lot, but I feel like these, the, these, these concepts, these ideas um, are often uh, Maybe misused or, 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 or overused, or, or they're not. They're, they're used without being given the the sort of thought and and understanding and consideration that they deserve. Um, and I think uh, as a result of of this, a lot of curators um, and artists and academics and 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 people that I've spoken to have tried to distance themselves from from concepts like intersectionality and 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 decoloniality and decolonizing. Um, and by in this preface, that's that's not something I'm trying to do. Um, so I, I think it's unfair to, to to disavow 
or, or reject an idea based on its misuse or its overuse. Um, and, and in light of this, I hope that rather than focusing on that, I hope that my paper or, or this discussion that we're about to have can, can spark at least some thought about what happens to, to, to radical ideas um, and their, their political potential when they're adopted and sort of consumed by um, institutions. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm a curator for, for a collection of Latin American art at the University of Essex and the, the, the exhibition in the other room um, really reminded me, particularly the, the letters that the artist wrote, um, really reminded me as a curator uh, how difficult it can be even in a small institution like the one that I'm a part of to, to really enact radical or, or courageous ideas um, when you have to deal with institutional polit uh, policies and, and politics and red tape, um, or even when you have to deal with other people that you work with or that you have to answer to who may not be on the same page as you. Um, and so I feel like often ideas like intersectionality or decolonizing, um, they become enacted uh, in, in a tentative sort of half-hearted way um, that ultimately neutralizes its political potential. Um, so I just wanted to preface by saying that um, when I was thinking about um, what to put in these slides, um, I came across this photo, which is um, from the gift shop at the Museum of Latin American Art in Buenos Aires. Uh, and it was part of uh, the gift shop during the exhibition that I'm talking about. Um, it was there at that time. Um, and I th it's a kind of a silly metaphor, but um, maybe it exemplifies how um, sort of radical or, or courageous ideas can become commodified and kind of lose their meaning. Um, and so I thought I would add that in. Um, and then finally, I just want to say before I begin that while uh, I don't want to distance myself from the ideas like decoloniality because of overuse or, or misuse, um, I have had uh, the privilege of, of reading and, and listening to and, and in some cases speaking with um, curators and artists and art practitioners that um, identify as indigenous. So people like uh, Wanda Nani Bush and Paul Chat Smith or Pablo Jose Ramirez who are people who I look up to and admire very much. Um, and speaking with them has made me wonder uh, whether the discourse of coloniality um, how productive it is and, and, and whether it is actually just serving to take up space um, that could be used for the centering of indigenous ways of thinking and indigenous ways of being. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say here is that just I'm very much on the fence about what I've written in this paper, which I wrote a long time ago, and I'm very much on the fence about, um, I guess, uh, the idea of, of, of decoloniality and um, I'm going to stay on that fence in this presentation, which is kind of a cop out. But um, yeah, um, maybe we can talk about that in the discussion. So yeah, um, just to begin, um, my paper critically discusses the concept of intersectionality, and it explores how it is applied within the research and exhibition of contemporary Latin American art. So intersectionality is a concept that came to prominence towards the end of the 20th century. And despite a lack of consensus to its exact definition, it's generally understood to study the ways in which social identities, particularly those of minorities, relate to systems of oppression. The concept acknowledges that identity traits and power structures such as gender, class, race, ability, and ethnicity cannot be understood in isolation from each other. They co-produce, they interact, and they shape one another. A review of the key literature uh, will be undertaken, so I, I, I do a literature review that outlines the evolution of this concept and pays particular attention to voices from the global south who have ironically largely been ignored within intersectionality's academic discourse. So a lot of the sources I draw from are, are voices of, of people, uh, academics, artists, curators from, from the global south. Um, Within the boundaries of, of this presentation, which I hope I don't go over too much in terms of time, um, a case study of the Museum of Latin American Art in Buenos Aires' permanent collection display called Berbo America will be provided, which is the exhibition you can see there. Um, I analyzed three artworks that range from 1968 to 2005, and my case study concludes that when undertaken in a particularized and nuanced way that bears in mind the complexities of an individual or collective identity, intersectionality has the potential to serve as a transformative and counter-hegemonic concept of knowledge production. 
It is therefore of exemplary importance in shaping art research and exhibition making practices. So in my literature review, um, I kind of look at basically whether there's a consensus on the definition of intersectionality and the answer is no. So it's in, in, in various papers it's described as a theory, a theoretical paradigm, a methodology. It's also described as a heuristic. So it's described in a, in, in a really, um, in, in a large variety of ways. Um, although intersectionality is traditionally associated with black feminist theory, the concept has extended beyond the boundaries of feminist scholarship and is now also understood as what Collins and Chep in 2013 call a generalized theory of identity. So it goes from being a very particular theory of marginalized subjectivity within the black feminist movement um, to a more generalized theory of identity. And in my full paper, I kind of expand on that and show all the different sources that show that evolution, but I won't, um, I won't do that now. Um, so the, the inability within the literature to to reach a, a defining consensus by intersectional scholars has led to a vagueness in its application. So many have argued, therefore, that a more robust and coherent methodology is needed in order for the concept to truly achieve its promise. In an attempt to create a uniform framework, the scholars Lutz and Venning in 2001 identified 14 fixed categories of difference that range from gender to de geographical location that they argue could be applied in most intersectional knowledge projects. Um, this creation of fixed categories, so 14 fixed categories of difference, um, is considered problematic by many, um, including myself, as often these categories derive from Western ontology and they may not exist or seem relevant when they cross certain borders. Um, indeed, the fixed nature of Lutz and Venning's uh, list, this, 14, this list of 14 categories of difference, seems to ignore intersectionality's key characteristic, which is complexity. Um, so Crenshaw, who, who coined the term intersectionality originally in 2013, argues that by focusing on fixed categories, identity politics and binaries are reinforced, and therefore the othering of marginalized subjects is reinforced as well. Crenshaw believes that all intersectional pro uh, knowledge projects must be particularized and therefore provisional and incomplete. There's no one-size-fits-all methodology for intersectionality, and thus the best way to define the concept is by looking at what it does rather than what it is. This argument builds on Nicole Davis's work in 2008, which suggests that intersectionality's ambiguity and incompleteness as a concept or theory is actually a strength rather than a weakness, as it allows for, for the concept or the conceptual tool to travel across academic disciplines and be used in a variety of ways. So this applicability of intersectionality across academic disciplines that Nicole Davis talks about in 2008 is further explored by the, the scholars Collar, Collins and Chep in 2013, as well as Fitz in 2009. Um, I'm saying a lot of names, and I'm happy to share my bibliography as well at the end with anyone who would like to read more, by the way. Um, but this part is particularly name dense, but it gets a bit better later on. Um, so Collins and Chep in 2013 argue that intersectionality should travel across academic fields, and they state that gender studies ownership of the concept has led to its robotic application and has caused scholars in other disciplines to feel prevented from using it. Intersectional knowledge projects stem from an epistemological recognition that a field's main paradigms are conceived within the context of power relations where white, middle-class, heterosexual, able-bodied male experiences are taken as the norm. By questioning this, the use of intersectional thinking leads to the challenging of an academic discipline's key assumptions. Intersectional knowledge projects can influence existing academic disciplines by creating new areas of research, particularly in those disciplines where academia connects with the public. For these reasons, I argue intersectionality is of exemplary importance within, academics field, within the academic fields of art and art history, where its praxis interact with the general pub public through channels such as exhibition making. So this essay tries to take on the call of, of, of scholars like Collins and Chep when they say um, that intersectionality should be put to use in other sites of inquiry. Um, with an understanding there of, of intersectionality as a theory that analyzes the complexity of, of human identity and the power structures that lead to social injustices, um, I'll begin to critically discuss how it has traditionally failed to be applied in the research and display of Latin American art and how it has successfully been employed in Malvas Verbo America exhibition.
and I've taken this out of the, these are just some examples of, of, of art historical uh, research where intersectionality was explicitly mentioned. And five years ago, there was actually a remarkably like low amount of, of, of um, work that explicitly mentioned intersectionality within its sort of methodology or, or even uh, within reviews of the work that mentioned intersectionality. And this one's a work called Racing Art History by Kimberly Pinder. And this is um, Fred Wilson's really well-known um, exhibition called uh, Mining the Museum. Um, but yeah, uh, I cut that out just to, for time. Um, so in, in Mari Carmen Ramirez's seminal study of displays of Latin American art uh, beyond the fantastic, the author notes that exhibitions are privileged vehicles of individual and collective identities. It is thus arguable that intersectionality as a theory of identity should be used in exhibition making in order to take into account the vast complexities and nuances of human experience. The pervasive problem with attempting to capture the distinct identity and issues of Latin America is that there's not one single hybrid culture within this vast geopolitical invention that is Latin America, but rather what Ramirez calls a heterogeneous ensemble. Intersectionality is the ideal tool to analyze and understand this heterogeneity. Malvas Verbo America exhibition analyzes Latin American identity and examines its power structures in an intersectional way that avoids ornamentality. This intersectional approach begins with the museum's creative director, Agustin Perez Rubio's understanding of temporality. And here's where I have, like, I think a lot of overlap with you, um, where I, I, I I've studied temporality more in not how artists conceive it, but more how it, it's reproduced within museums and within curatorial models. So um, in Robert's 2014 book called Getting Intersectional in the Museum, the author argues against using the historic survey, which sort of presents a linear view of art history as, as an exhibition model. She notes that the notion of, of linear temporality is entrenched within Western ideas of progress and of modernization. Um, museums conceive of time as an, uh, as an organizing structure grounded in cultural assumptions about race, gender, and sexuality. And its use reproduces exclusionary cultural values. Similarly, Ramirez in 92 argued that the historic survey, which is consistently used or was consistently used to display Latin American art, is a reflection of the ideology of European and American modernity, leading to the selection of works based on Western standards and it is therefore flawed when attempting to engage and reflect identities in peripheral societies. Verbo America's exhibition model challenges this mode of thought, with Ruby asserting that the job of an art historian is a political one that should aim to question the Eurocentric assumptions prevailing in the discipline. Thus, Verbo America's art is displayed in a format that is not static, but rather it's performative and temporal. It aims to challenge the idea of linear time through the creation of diverse temporalities that coexist and co-produce. Verbo America does not try to represent one sole Latin America, but rather several Latin Americas, distinct and diverse, displaying the understanding of heterogeneity and complexity needed for a successful intersectional knowledge project. Perez defines the South as colonial, black, migratory, feminine, queer, indigenous, and peripheral, and displays the art in eight interacting co-producing categories that relate to gender, race, ethnicity, indigeneity, and geographical location, among other power structures and identity traits. So an important criticism of intersectional knowledge projects is that they often use categories that stem from Western cultural values and thus do not translate when applied in the global South. Um, it's noted that a persistent shortcoming of intersectional interventions is that they place too much emphasis on the categories of sexuality and gender, producing an ironic reification of sexual difference and cementing sexual, cementing sexual and gender difference as the constant from which there, is, there are variants. This criticism is particularly important in the Latin American context where the issues of indigenous people, ecology, and class are equally, if not more, uh, important. Malva's categories reflect Crenshaw's belief that all intersectional moves are particularized, demonstrating a nuanced understanding of Latin America by utilizing categories that reflect the region's particular power structures. Verbo America's curators not only utilize structures that explore sexuality and gender, as most intersectional knowledge projects do, but they also factor in ethnicity, race, geographical location, ecology, providing a robust picture of the multidimensionality of human identity. Um, 
So the exhibition's curators show their exemplary understanding of intersectionality by selecting and displaying art that serves to identify and dismantle the region's power structures. Three works from three different categories within the collection will be analyzed to demonstrate how Malva's nuanced intersectional approach not only analyzes identity, but also explores the distinct power dynamics that lead to discrimination in Latin America. So the first case, um, the, f the first photograph that I talk about is uh, from Alfredo Jar's Gold in the Morning series. So Gold in the Morning uh, depicts a quasi-apocalyptic scene of miners, both men and women, the majority people of color, some of indigenous background working in wretched conditions. The repetition within the series alludes to the labor Sisyphean nature and its intimate portraits work to humanize the marginalized subaltern. The photographs are displayed alongside live prices of gold a juxtaposition that reminds the viewers of the region's colonial past ravaged for gold by European settlers, causing the viewers to question the value of life and asserting that neoliberalism is simply a renewed expression of coloniality. The series features in the exhibition's Map, Geopolitics, and Power Cluster, a category that examines the practice of mapping, counter-mapping, and the modern European relationship to our environment, one that views nature as inert commodity to be extracted for wealth. It is the first of a trio of clusters that are placed within close succession of each other. The other two categories are indigenous America, black America, and rurality and peripheries. Their proximity allows the works to interact, building a narrative that sheds light on how ecology, geographical location, gender, and, ethni and ethnicity co-produce. So this work is uh, by Jesus Ruiz Durant, who is a, 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 Peruvian, a Peruvian artist. Um, and it features in the Indigenous America, Black America category. Um, the series consists of posters with political messages uh, promoting an agrarian revolution, aiming to engage particularly indigenous populations in Peru's peripheries. The poster uses images of Incan icons and photographs of farmers as, as a call to arms against the Peruvian government's capitalist policies and its disproportionate effects on women of indigenous background in rural locations. Much of the series focuses on the images of women, showing the Peruvian society's expectations of women to work, raise children, and also be politically active. The use of pop art as its language also hints at the USA's economic and cultural hegemony over Latin America. The third and final piece I talk about is um, Maria Teresa Ponce's Kilometro 485, which features in r the rurality and peripheries cluster. The piece consists of a series of photographs of an oil duct that stretches through Ecuador. The series documents how the duct affects rural populations' water supply, particularly for women who are often burdened with the task of cleaning clothes and bathing children in the bodies of water affected by this duct. The photograph complicates the binary of nature and culture and hints at the entanglement between the landscape, its matter, and the humans that live within it. The, portray the portrayal of children brings to light the dynamics of age, a threat, of the, a threat that the degradation of land will have long-lasting generational effects. So this brief example is a small demonstration, basically, of how these three eight clusters and the works within them are part of the exhibition's intersectional approach, how they interact, how these clusters are porous and, 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 and they're meant to interact and show how these different sort of power structures co-produce. Um, the specific pieces interact to provide a glimpse into the consequences of ecological degradation and capitalist policies within Latin America and then how they disproportionately affect indigenous uh, rural women as well. On the wider plane, it can also be said that the narrative provides a picture of the unbalanced power dynamic between North and South. I think scrutinous attention must be paid to the use of intersectionality within museums, however, um, particularly within this museum, Malba, which is uh, a, a private museum and, and, and I, I say predominantly white in its workforce here, although I don't know that for a fact, I'm just saying that from going there a bunch of times. Um, through the continuous mention uh, of, of difference, one risks uh, reinforcing re difference, thus reifying the identity of the other. This is something that I argue that all researchers must take into account when applying the concept within the field. Um, just to finish as well, I say that particular attention needs to be paid to how intersectionality is adopted within the academy and within museums. So radical tools and concepts such as intersectionality can become neutralized and stripped of their political agency through the guise of inclusion within the university or museum context. 
concepts such as in intersectionality risk being absorbed by the new flexible neoliberal university, which founds its logic on the reorder of things, including difference, only in order to strengthen its power. Thus, ideas such as these have been commodified and de-radicalized by governments, corporations, and other institutions for neoliberal purposes, transforming a theory of radical politics and social justice into a corporate tool leveraged to attain various ideological and institutional goals. Uh, a scholar um, called Bilge in 2013 coined the term ornamental intersectionality, which is a watered-down opportunistic use of the concept that results in its neutralization. Art museums are not exempt of this behavior, and Ramirez in 92 was already arguing that the increase in Latin American art exhibitions that was happening in the late 80s was largely due to sponsor firms, to museum sponsor firms' neoliberal strategy to corner what was a growing market within the U.S., a growing Latin American population. Um, ornamental intersectionality in the case of exhibitions of Latin American art have led to stereotypes, cliché, and, and oversimplification when attempting to portray a collective Latin American identity. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to finish there. Thank you.